Hi, and welcome to Concordia Today. I'm Anne Lucier. And I'm Jenny Raymond. Later, we'll have a report on CRSG Radio by Dina Pino, and reporter Natalie Vandenbosch will interview Mariana Simeone, who is the executive director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce. But first, the news brought to you by Concordia's journalism department. Concordia and McGill are pairing up to shape up. The two universities have agreed to integrate services including libraries, academic programs, and accounting systems. The sharing of resources is expected to improve the services for both universities. Concordia's rector, Frederick Lowy, said this is not a merger with McGill, rather a way for the universities to work more closely. Should they stay or should they go? That's the question Vice Rector Jack Lightstone will be answering as he develops a plan to deal with government cutbacks. Lightstone will decide which courses and departments need to be changed or phased out. Rector Frederick Lowy explained that scrapping various programs is the only way to face the budget cuts. Lowy also said that Concordia's more renowned programs will be strengthened at the same time. As midterms creep closer, many students feel that there aren't enough hours in the day to get everything done. Yet Concordia boasts hundreds of students who balance their workloads while volunteering for a worthy cause. How do they do it? Letha Henry caught up with a few of these unsung heroes and tried to find out. Spending weeks behind bars can get pretty lonely, but students like Isabel Tremblay are helping make these animals' days a little bit brighter. Isabel is just one of over a hundred student volunteers the SPCA relies on for its organization to run smoothly. And like most volunteers, she has her own special reasons for lending a hand. Because I want to be a veterinarian and it helps to, uh, to have been experienced with animals. So I work at the adoption, so I kind of gave up, give up animals, choose uh, nice families for them. Coordinator Joel Elias says that the volunteers do almost everything the employees do. They clean, clean up after the animals, uh, they help people adopt animals, they work uh, the ever busy reception counter over here. This is just a quiet time of day, you see. Although the volunteers have many different jobs and responsibilities, they do share one common trait, a love for animals and their welfare, no matter how small or big they might be. For Concordia Today, this is Letha Henry. Concordia kicked off the internal phase of the capital campaign in a festive mood. Fresh Ideas, Nouveaux Horizons, the campaign for a new millennium, will be a dynamic one. The energetic campaign team showed off their enthusiasm at last week's rally held at the Molson Center. The goal of the campaign is to raise 55 million over five years. So far, over $200,000 is in the bank. Move over, Dr. Ruth. Concordia students have their very own sex advisor. She's a psychology student from Texas and author of Health Notes column Sex with Tex. Jennifer Hollett has more. Let's talk about sex, a taboo topic for some, not for Ashley Diener. Also known by the nickname Tex, it's her favorite school subject. Sex with Tex is a sex advice column. Um, it's pretty much for our peers to show them it's an anonymous column, just to show that our show our peers that it's you know any question, sex related questions they have um, aren't embarrassing and they're not stupid to ask because sex is a very you know important issue and that they should write in if they have any questions because sex is a responsibility and you need to know what it entails. Last week, Tex helped run a safer sex booth at Concordia's health fair. She promotes safer sex health and well-being among Concordia students as a peer health educator. It's definitely an important issue and I'm not encouraging sex but if you do have sex to be careful and to be safe because you know it's dangerous. Sex with Tex is published by Concordia Health Services. It is available on both the Loyola and Sir George campuses. For Concordia Today, I'm Jennifer Holland. The MUC police is hoping to make Loyola safer. Within the next two years, it will be implementing a new neighborhood safety program. MUC police hope to diminish prostitution, drugs, theft, and poverty in the region by inaugurating more police stations and decentralizing police activities. This hands-on policy is currently underway in NDG. Icicles on the window, ants in the kitchen, and broken appliances. Sound like living conditions of the indigent? Well, think again. These are just some of the complaints from students who live in Concordia's only residence in Hingston Hall. The Dean of Students, Donald Boisvert, said that while the school does have a responsibility, so do the students. Boisvert said that the university has had to invest major bucks in Hingston due to acts of vandalism. 
Now for a Concordia Kodak moment. Barbara Golub is a recipient of the 1995 Kodak Award from Concordia's Department of Photography. Her photos reflect her concern for people and their social situations. With more, here's Caroline de Rosière. Documentary photograph Barbara Golub received her BFA degree in photography from Concordia University. But she started off as a painter. Then she moved on to sculpture and photo lithography. It was the latter that drew her to photography. She wanted to interact with her subjects. Golub undertook a photo series of 12 women between the ages of 66 and 99, entitled In Praise of Older Women. Golub feels the years have given these women an expressive beauty and depth to their features. That is the beauty Golub wants to show and expose. But some women have felt the need to undergo a cosmetic surgery. As both a woman and photographer, Golub wishes to give a visual presence to the issue of cosmetic surgery. So I say that we have to um, become more mature in our outlook and we have to um, look at a, a wide diversity of, of uh, beautiful images. And um, that's my, my focus in doing the series on cosmetic surgery was for that reason. To be fit, beautiful, and young, that's every woman's target. Here it is. Uh, the image of Barbie is what a lot of women base themselves on tw in terms of uh, what they would like to look like after cosmetic surgery. We're all afraid of aging and especially of wrinkles, but whether you choose surgery or not, we're all going to be old one day. Even these gorgeous women, so cheer up. To conclude you today, I'm Caroline de Rosière. Various student groups will remain with the condemned until June. Last September, the building that houses the Concordia newspaper and CFLI radio was condemned for being in violation of fire safety codes. Concordia's public and fire safety officers said that an enormous amount of work would have to be done to bring the building up to par. There are plans to move the remaining groups to the basement of the Loyola Campus Center, but this has not been finalized. With two feet of snow on the ground and midterms just around the corner, it seems that the winter blues are here to stay. But take heart because spring break is not far off. Andrea Howick went to find out how some students will be spending theirs. Every year, thousands of Canadian students flock to the south for a midwinter holiday. February is the time of year when cold days and long nights studying for midterms really takes its toll on students. So when spring break finally rolls around, it's a welcome relief. Concordia Travel Cuts manager Clara Suarez has we some advice for students soon. planning to get away. I always say book early. I mean, if you're really sure that you're going and uh, you already have your group uh, established, definitely book early. Most uh, students can't afford expensive please, vacations, um, but they know where they'd go if they could. I'd say the Greek islands, but I can't afford that. Somewhere far, far away from here, somewhere warm, I guess. So. I was thinking about maybe going to the Dominican Republic, you know, Puerto Plata, the beach, sunshine, beautiful women. Suarez says the most popular and affordable destinations remain Florida, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. And smart travelers are taking her advice and booking early. If you're like most students, though, and can't afford a trip to an exotic island for spring break, you probably can't afford a trip to your local video store. For Concordia Today, I'm Andrea Howick. Concordia students are doing their homework in China. Urban study students are helping find a solution to the never-ending traffic jams in the country's major cities. Students will use their research methods and experience to develop a model that will help achieve a better mix of pedestrians, bicycles, and cars. The project is supervised by professors John Zacharias and Haiking Zhu. Both professors traveled to China recently to establish the collaborative study. As founder of the Intersex Society of Canada, PhD student Morgan Holmes has a goal to get people thinking of intersexuality as a cultural identity. Presently, one out of 2,000 babies are born without a gender. Later on, these children undergo cosmetic surgery to clearly define their sex. Holmes has become the center of media attention for her theories on intersexuality. 
a promising weekend evening at Reggie's turned sour. Concordia's CFLI Radio threw a fundraising concert with the band Thelma headlining the triple bill. The band is formed by two Concordia graduates, one of which is a former CFLI music director. Because old habits die hard for this band, Thelma did not even get to the third song of their set. Geneviève Tremblay reports. There is one question burning everybody's lips when they hear of Thelma, and the four members are tired of hearing it. Uh, where's, where's Louise? Louise? Uh, where's, where's Louise? Louise? Like its music, Thelma has a very in-your-face attitude. The band is banned from almost every venue in Montreal for acting like jerks on stage. I broke a mic stand for fun. Oh my god. I mean, and so they got very upset, so... Okay, I went up and I was chewing Subway and spitting pieces of sand. We left after one and a half songs. But besides that, we're pretty nice guys. Some members of Thelma spend a whole evening criticizing the other band's music in an attempt to recapture the true essence of rock and roll. But things backfired during their own gig. Thelma literally had the rug pulled from under their feet by the other bands, which make the gig end on a bad note. For Concordia Today, I'm Geneviève Tremblay. Canadian writer and Concordia MA student Bennett Davidian was honored with the first Prix Parizeau for his book entitled The Seventh Circle. Davidian spoke about the award during a seminar at Concordia last Wednesday. The literary prize recognizes the best work of a fiction by an ethnic or impure wool. Davidian was pleased with the recognition but has no interest in the political aspect of the prize. And this concludes the news for this week. Stay tuned for a report on CRSG Radio produced by Dina Pino and an interview with Mariana Simeone, the Executive Director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us at Concordia today. I'm Jenny Raymond. And I'm Anik Lucie. Have a good week, everyone. Did you, uh... Concordia's hall building was condemned to silence last semester due to obstacles at CRSG's radio station. The corridors were without sound and the doors to the DJ booth remained tightly closed for the first half of the academic year. Jennifer Hollett, station manager of Concordia Radio Sir George, explains. In July, our mixer broke down and uh, it's been noted by our sound engineer it was a problem that an accident waiting to happen, it's been noted. Uh, basically, in campus radio, we're using equipment that's state of the decade, and that's being generous, saying that it's not every day a mixer goes down. And the mixer is your whole station. It's the brainchild. It's the brains of the whole station. So when that goes down, I, I, I can't think of anything that worse could have happened to us. The equipment was in need of some tender, loving repair. Money for this was to come from Concordia's media fund. There was a vote. The students agreed that they were going to put um, some money per credit into campus media, being CUTV, CFLY, CRSG, and HAM Amateur Radio. So we were happy with that. And uh, the only problem is it's been a delay in money getting to us. The original one week delay was extended into a frustrating two month wait for CRSG executives and DJs. The Concordia Student Union is responsible in part for the media fund. Pascal Ouellette joined the CSU in September as VP Finance. He explains the reason for the delay. Um, the cause of that is that uh, the time that the university uh, collects, actually collects the money and transfers that amount of money into our internal account uh, takes about, uh, I would say, uh, f a few months. Uh, in fact, the, the money that was collected sometime in September was in fact deposited in our account, internal account, on the 30th of, of October. So that's the reason why we got a delay uh, of about a month. An anxiously awaited CRSG meeting was held in January for all returning DJs. Thank you for your patience uh, with all the problems we ran into at the station, uh, which I will go over um, next. Uh, but basically it was a matter of lack of budget, uh, a little bit of uh, politics uh, between not only the student union but Concordia University as a whole, and uh, just other problems with shipping and uh, I think anything that could have happened did. CRSG can presently be heard on the 4th, 5th and 6th floors of the hall building as well as on FM cable. The executive team is, however, up to the challenge of expanding their listening audience. 
What we're looking at is more realistic goals. I mean, some radio stations like to promise their DJs they're going to get an FM license, but I wouldn't want to give you false hope in doing that. What is in our future is one we're trying to get onto Videotron. Jimmy's already doing the proposal for that, which is a definitely we have to do because CF Cable and Videotron is merging. The all ABBA ABBA absolutely fabulous edition of Gotta 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 Dance. This is the randomizer keeping you going on CRSG live music for dead times. <laughs> I know for myself it's helped me with a lot of other things. Um, I am in journalism and communications, so it's really helped me out in my portfolio and my resume. And uh, being a DJ, I think anyone could attest to, it's great for developing your skills on air. Um, being able to talk and not being nervous doing so, being comfortable with the microphone, being comfortable with the audience, as well music, being on top of music. CRSG is a very recreational activity that I thoroughly enjoy because it is actually very constructive. It doesn't feel like I'm doing something for no reason. I'm doing something that accomplishes something very positive. Yeah, I really always wanted to get into the music industry and um, now that I'm a DJ, I really have a chance to learn a lot about it and it's a lot of fun. I really like it. CRSG, what, what does CRSG mean to me? Uh, I, all I know is I, I speak to people who are in the radio industry now who've been in for 20 years and they say, Enjoy CRSG because it's the last time you'll be able to do whatever you want, you know? I, you could, I, I mean, I could do an hour of disco if I wanted, I could do an hour of death metal, but CRSG, we truly are live music for dead times. One thing new we have coming up is every Monday night at Reggie's, we have a co-op going on where um, DJs from the radio station DJ at Reggie's, which is Concordia School Pub, and depending on what show, what type of music the DJ plays, they're going to go to Reggie's and play that music. So it's great for CRSG, CRSG gets their name out and it's also great for Reggie's because they get new DJs, uh, friends of the DJs in the station come in, they can get some sales at the bar, and it gets Reggie's name out as well. So that's something we're, started, uh, we're starting. It looks like 1997 is off to a good start, but what do the students think about CRSG back riding the airwaves? Uh, I think it's good. It gives a little more, uh, we'll say, a, a lively atmosphere, I guess, you know, as opposed to just dead, uh, you know, scary university hallways, you know what I mean? I think it's great. Great to have them back. Good to have some noise in the halls. I love the music. I love uh, the interviewers. Everything is great. It's uh, the best 100%. CRSG Live Music for Dead Times. You too can become a CRSG groupie. Just tune in to 88.9 Cable FM. For Concordia Today, I'm Dina Pino. experience can present the student with many challenges and the challenge of facing new experiences. In this environment, some students might lose touch with their roots. Our guest today is a Concordia alumna who found personal fulfillment and career success by looking to her roots to help shape her future. She is Mariana Simeone and she's the executive director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce. Welcome. Good morning. It's nice to be here. <laughs> so how important is it for you to be working uh, so closely with the Italian business community? extremely important. It's, it's the essence of who I am. It's the essence of what Concordia has given me as a, as a graduate student. It's me. And when you graduated in 1986, right? Mm -hmm. you, had an honor, you got an honors degree in Italian. Right. At that time, where did you see uh, your future going? Definitely not uh, with the chamber, probably not in Montreal. I had uh, returned to school after a four-year uh, pause in my uh, academic uh, uh, my academic background and um, I had gone to school back to school for me for myself so I this degree in Italian really didn't mean an Italian job it just meant something that would enrich uh, my person and I was looking ahead to perhaps furthering my education but I wasn't thinking of work at the time but has your degree helped you in terms of uh, per in pursuing your job at the Italian Chamber of oh, Commerce? Oh, definitely. Without it, I would not be there at all, at all, at all. Um, things have a way of happening in life. There, there are certain connections that just happen because of, of timing, because of place, because of people you meet. Concordia was definitely a part of, of everything that's ever happened to me since I've returned to school. 
And uh, how important is it, to have, what's the difference between the Italian Chamber of Commerce with, let's say, the Montreal Chamber of okay. Commerce? What is that you... We're an international business trade promotion and um, assistance association for the business community at large who are interested in doing business with Italy and for Italian companies who are interested in doing business with uh, Canadian companies. The Montreal Board of Trade is, is a local organization that fosters and, and helps local company network and, and do business locally, that lobby. We do a lot of those things also, but our, our field of play, let's say, is international and is, is Italy in this case. So you're, you're the executive director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and you have two small children, four and two, yes. and um, you are pursuing another degree. Yes. How do you do it? Do you ever feel like a super mom? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just uh, have a very busy schedule. I organize everything to the last minute. Um, I'm very focused. Um, I try always and keep my objectives in, in line, but most of all I, I prioritize. I, I prioritize uh, extensively. Once you have a family, um, your optic on life seems to shift a little bit. Um, career is very important, but family is more important. So you have to be able to reach the right balance, and to do that you have to really be surrounded by a, a full support network, what I like to call it, your support network, your family, your friends, your employer has to also be very understanding. So you just put things in place so that you, things can work out. Do you think there's a lot of pressure for women to uh, pursue it all and to do it all? There's pressure for everyone these days. We have an added pressure, and that's the fact that we, for some reason, are burdened with the home factor. Uh, this has changed uh, extensively, and we're very lucky to be living in, in the era that we're living. But women, I believe, are, are pressured because they bring on to themselves undue pressure. We have the sense of guilt when we work late. We have the sense of guilt when we have to travel for business. So this is, I guess, an attitude that we women are going to have to cope with. Um, do you think, so then there's also a pressure um, in a sense that maybe women put on themselves to stay home with the children. Did you ever feel that? Oh, yes. Every time I delivered a, uh, a son, I wanted to stay <laughs> home. <laughs> and things just then after come into focus afterwards. But it's very natural and it's very normal to want to stay home, to give that time to those babies that do need it. Um, now that you're pursuing another degree, how do you hope that that's going to, where, where, how, where do you hope that's going to take you? Well, uh, nowhere for now. I just want that degree, again, for myself. Uh, I think I need uh, that extra, um, those three extra letters, like we like to call them. And I look forward to coming back to Concordia to, to complete that MBA. I've begun now with the French uh, part of it. I would like to perfect my French because it's very, ever so important. And, and then further uh, go ahead with this uh, business administration. You speak several languages, mm -hmm. uh, English, French, Italian, obviously, and German. Yes. How important is it to be multilingual today in the job oh, market? Extremely important. Extremely important, especially in North America, especially here in Montreal. It's an added advantage. It's an extra asset. It's, uh, it's that, that extra that uh, will get you that interview, will get you, will get you noticed at that meeting. It is very important. And you learn languages here at Concordia and by going out and experiencing it in, 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 Ital in the Italian community, you went to Italy. But what did you think was the, what do you think is the best way to learn a language? Of course, for full immersion. I was very fortunate. Before I returned to Concordia, I began my studies at the University of Naples at the time. Uh, following a, a family um, incident, I, I was, uh, I, I moved back to Italy for a little while, so I was very lucky in that sense. But while I was at Concordia, for example, for the German part of it, I attended the Canadian Summer School for Students in Germany, and that was absolutely enlightening, not only from the linguistic point of view, but from the learning experience. Imagine at the time, the Berlin Wall was still up, and I have a picture in front of it. So, you know, it, it really, full immersion, you must visit the countries, you must uh, know the culture and, and get to know the people. Mm -hmm. You were also very active and involved. Uh, you, you know, were active in the Italian uh, organization here at Concordia, and you did some theater, yes. I understand. And I was wondering how that affected uh, your, you know, your going out and getting jobs. Oh, it was all interconnected, like I said. Being involved with the school got me involved with other organizations outside the school. Imagine from a, from a theater company here, we put on a, a very nice Italian play, while a producer of a, of a quasi-professional theater company noticed me and asked me to join their group, which I did, and from there, a television producer noticed me and asked me to join Italian TV, and from there, the board of directors of the chamber <laughs> noticed me, and, and there you go. But you also had a bit of a stint in politics. <laughs> very well, short. Well, what was that like? Very short. A brief, just a few months, I joined the cabinet uh, of a then minister who was Italian of origin and as his press attaché. Very interesting, but it was just wasn't to me, so 
Okay. How has trade in, um, been affected by, let's say, the NAFTA and the EEC agreements? Do you find that that has changed your job and has that faced you with new challenges? New challenges, forever new challenges, forever new, uh, new fields of, of playing, therefore forever having to... Uh, to, uh, to update ourselves on, on new issues and keeping our members informed. But over the last uh, five years, I say that it, trade between our two countries has been on the increase, and we're so happy. Okay, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. But thank you very much, Mariana, for joining us. Well, thank you. Um, please join us again next week when Nikki Campbell will have a report on washroom graffiti. Also, reporter Nick Lucier will interview Mackie Vaticino, who is the uh, president and CEO of Murray Axsmith. If you have any questions or comments, comments please email us at Studio A at Vax2.concordia.ca. Have a good week, everyone.
Hi, and welcome to Concordia Today. I'm Jenny Raymond. And I'm Natalie Vandenbosch. Later, we'll have a report on Wash from Graffiti by Nikki Campbell. And reporter Nick Lucier will interview Mackie Vaticino, the president and CEO of Murray Axsmith. But first, the news brought to you by Concordia's journalism department. Quality computer products, low prices, and friendly service. Who could ask for anything more? Students who are unhappy with Concordia's co-op service, that's who. They say the co-op isn't all it's cracked up to be because it's a monopoly. So it doesn't make an effort to help students. Not so, says co-op's manager Chris Beck. He says the co-op hasn't been a monopoly since the computer store opened in the library building. Several students have complained about waiting for months for computers they thought were readily available. If you won't take the blame, blame it on somebody else. This blame game is being played by members of CUSA Corp, the money-making arm of the Concordia Student Union. General Operations Manager Len Pemberton was suspended for disobeying orders. VP CUSA Corp Daniel Refuse blames Pemberton for not providing statements of the money account, while Pemberton blames Refuse for not handling his own responsibilities. Finally, CUSA Corp Board of Directors Chair Robert Sonnen blames both Pemberton and Refuse and is concerned with their performances. As the Quebec government makes spending cuts to education, Concordia has to look elsewhere for additional sources of income. As Tim Sargent reports, one place they're looking is from the students themselves. Concordia's capital campaign is underway. Part of their goal is to raise $9 million over 10 years from additional student fees. Starting next fall, each student may have to donate as much as $45 to $60 a year, depending on their course load and year of study. Carol Kleingrib says most of the money raised will be spent on recreation and athletic facilities, financial aid, and the libraries. By participating in this capital campaign, the students will ensure that their degree is as strong as the university uh, grows and evolves over time. And what do students think? I think it would really be a problem for, um, for every student, no matter what their financial situation is have to pay an extra 40 or 50 dollars. I guess if it serves the purpose and if the government's not going to help us, you know, get anywhere, I guess we have to help ourselves, right? Of course, all of this is subject to a vote. On March 7th, about 140 student representatives and executives will meet to determine whether students help contribute towards improving their own facilities. For Concordia Today, I'm Tim Sargent. Five students are fighting mad that the Bank of Cusa Corp's used bookstore is filling up at their expense. They say they were never warned about the January 31st deadline to pick up their money or unsold books. However, Vice President Dan Rafuse says they were. At present, the student union pockets 25% of the book's worth and Cusa Corp keeps the book at, that aren't picked up by the deadline. Hingston Hall came under fire recently when residents claimed they were living in filth and the administration was doing nothing about it. Are the authorities to blame for the building's decay or are the students the ones responsible for the mess? Letha Henry paid a visit to Concordia residents to try and find out. Hingston Hall serves as a home away from home for nearly 150 Concordia students every year. With so many people under one roof, cleanliness has fast become an afterthought and maintenance a luxury. We had a microwave that got broken upstairs wasn't repaired for like months and months and months and months. Dryers don't dry anymore like we've been asking to get them fixed. And we deal with a various number of complaints uh, over the course of the year and I, I, I mean they, a good deal of them uh, were, were valid and there are problems that we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, we try and deal with everything individually and, and as quickly as possible. Yet some students feel that it's not the administration, but their own fellow residents that need to clean up their act. Um, just because I don't like to live with uh, slovenly other people that uh, you know, don't take pride in where they live, and I have to suffer because of their own inconsiderate selves. But no matter how divided they might be, residents will somehow always manage to put away their differences and come together for one worthy cause, to have a good time. For Concordia Today, this is Letha Henry. The tide is high for internet surfing at the Mez Cafe. Five computers have been updated and made available for internet use free of charge until reading week. After this three week period, students will have to pay $2 per half hour or $3 per hour. The Mez Internet Cafe will run daily from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. It seems that the Concordia Student Union rules are meant to be broken. The CSU approved the posting of flyers from another travel agency than Voyage Campus. The CSU and Voyage Campus have an informal agreement of the exclusivity of rights of poster advertising at Concordia. The agreement is meant to support Voyage Campus, which has been renting office space from the CSU for several years. CSU VP External Carl Khoury said the approval of Student Travel Club was given by mistake. 
the Garnet Key Society is having some image problems. No one seems to know who they are. The members of this unwittingly secret student group act as host at official Concordia University functions. With more, here's Lisa Tedford. This jacket represents the few, the proud, the Garnet Key. Unfortunately, this select society is almost completely unknown to students. What was the name of it again? I have no idea whatsoever. Some sort of security operation, I don't know. Even though few people know who they are, the president says he is not worried about the society's future. Through recruiting, we just have to make it people more aware of the club, but it's never going to end. Sonia Galampe says because of the recognition problems, wearing the garnet colored jacket is a necessity. So they represent the official color of the university, and we wear them because people uh, can recognize us at the events. With a history in the university stretching back 40 years, Hi. new blood is an important key yeah. to keeping the society alive. Welcome to Garden Key. Thank you. Becoming a member also has advantages for Concordia students. I think it'd be a good way to represent Concordia University and wear the red jackets and meet people of different backgrounds. If you ever want to try one of these on, you'll have to contact the Garnicky Society. For Concordia Today, I'm Lisa Tedford. Hungry students in need of assistance may be finally getting a break. The Concordia Student Union says it will provide needy students with a food bank at the downtown campus by late spring. Students will have to meet a financial profile used by the financial aid office to qualify. Those who don't will be able to shop at the student-wide grocery store that is due to open this spring. Fire hazards, faulty wires and poor ventilation sound like a fire safety video, but it's home to CFLI Radio and the Concordian newspaper. They are two of several groups lodged in the deteriorating building that has forced a relocation. Ilana Schachter reports on how the Centennial Building crumbles. The Centennial Building is located here at the Loyola campus. Tired of the office's physical decay, the Concordian's editor-in-chief, Andrew Sung, caves in. Uh, some of the problems we've experienced are, number one, uh, some of the roofs are actually falling in. Um, and then there's a little problem with the foundation going in little angles. We notice it most probably because we're in the basement. The building is just not wired for the modern, to accommodate, you know, modern things like a computer. Uh, I'd kind of like to be brought back into the 20th century. The building's decay has also affected the radio station. Seafly's Jordan Zivitz explains. You see cracked plaster, and it is a fire trap, but it hasn't really affected the runnings of the station just so much as sort of become a constant nagging. Several clubs and services, like health services, have already been relocated to the downtown campus. Only time will tell where Concordian and Seafly Radio will end up. For Concordia Today, I'm Ilana Schachter. Students at the downtown campus may finally get a chance to see something other than concrete under their feet. If the greening of McKay Coalition get their way, they'll see green on and around McKay Street. The idea of greening McKay hasn't been approved yet, but Dean of Students Donald Boisval says reactions to the project have been favorable. A benefit called the Green and Brown Party will be held February 28th to help fund the project. They shoot, he saves. The Concordia men's hockey team knows it can count on their goalie, Benoit Richard, to stop the puck. Game after game, King Richard proves he can cut it in the face of adversity. In a 3-3 tie against the McGill Redmen, Richard faced 57 shots and survived. But Richard can't save everything. Head coach Yves Bocage knows Concordia can finish second in the division final, but says it requires effort from everyone on the team. From dishwater to retail detail, it's time to head out and find that summer job. Whether you're graduating or not, there are ways to turn a boring summer stint into a career move. I was on the job for this report. Tired of working the usual McJob? Well, you won't have to go far for a whole menu of alternatives. Dr. Priscilla David from Counseling and Development at Concordia says the first step to finding a good job is finding yourself. So they have to start with a self-assessment and unless they have a clear career target they're going to have difficulty in finding jobs and very often that's the one step the students like to skip. If your passion for fashion does not include a folding guide then it's probably time to work on that CV. Concordia Career and Placement Services have trained students like Tyrone Oliver to give you some tips. Because what we want to do is we want, we want to put our most important things on the first page, okay? Because a lot of employers don't turn to the second page until after Mm -hmm. say if they've decided if they're going to interview you or not. Some students who have started their search know it's important to remain optimistic. I have to believe that there was something out there for me and I have to motivate myself to look. 
If you're planning to head out and pound the pavement, you might want to consider surfing as well. Concordia's career and placement services can help you get your CV on the net. For Concordia Today, I'm Natalie Vandenbosch. Heroic goaltending keeps the Concordia women's hockey team alive. Most of the credit for the 1 1 tie against the St. Lawrence Patriot goes to goalie Diane Meyer. She stopped 27 shots, several of which came off of breakaways and saved Concordia from what could have been an embarrassing loss. Mayor says she's out there to have fun and enjoys having lots of shots coming at her. It keeps her sharp. Teammate Cami Granado only has praise for her goalie, whom she says plays with great confidence. That's the news for this week. I'm Natalie Vandenbosch. And I'm Jenny Raymond. Coming up next on Concordia Today is a report on washroom graffiti by Nikki Campbell. Also, reporter Annick Lucia will interview Mackie Vadacino, president and CEO of Murray Axsmith. Have a good week, everyone. I think graffiti is entertainment. Just little scribblings are, are, are the same thing as whispering your deepest thoughts. People are saying extremely personal and intimate things. It's frowned upon and constantly wiped away. So why are people so fascinated with these little etchings on the wall? We talked to a few Concordia students to get their reactions to the graffiti that surrounds them. And this is what they had to say. And then I've, I've seen uh, writing on bathroom walls where people have written something, responded, responded to the response, and it's sort of gone down the line. And you're sitting there, and that's what you do. You sort of fall all the way down. And sometimes you feel almost obliged, if you have something to say, just to add a little bit to it. It's like a, a natural progression, and you want to be part of the chain, part of the debate. It's anonymous. It's safe. It's a place for information exchange. It's a place where people... Um, forge out identities for themselves and it's a place where they get to practice it before they have to do it in the real world. Uh, I'm not much in favor of people who do graffiti. Uh, generally it's done on buildings. Uh, it is not terribly exciting to look at. Uh, it uh, disfigures uh, the, uh, you know, the architecture. Learning occurs on so many different levels. It occurs on the academic and the intellectual level. It also occurs on the social level. And, you know, at least, at least judging from the women who are writing the graffiti in the women's bathroom, I think it's very much they're trying to learn a lot more about their environment and about how people are thinking. Opinions may vary, but one thing is clear. There is a distinction between what is written on the men's wall and what is written on the women's. The girls' bathroom is it's really dealing with a lot of social issues that they can't have any other place. And uh, there was one question like, my boss is hitting on me and he's married, what should I do? So she asks everyone and people start responding. And then you get a whole spectrum of people answering her. And maybe she's just trying to find the answer that best suits her. And what do the men have to say? Well, when I go into a bathroom, let's say at school for example, and I know that I have about two or three minutes to kill. I'm spending the first 15 seconds opening up different bathroom stalls, five in a row sometimes there are. I'll look in each one quickly to see which one has the most writing because I know that if I'm going to spend a couple of minutes in there, I want to spend one in something that I have something to read. And while the men are busy finding themselves a pastime, you're also getting all these great dialogues about, you know, uh, body image and sexuality and, um, you know, women's issues. Usually oh, the kind of stuff really I get good. is grossly yeah. sexual. Every once I in a while you get an enlightened sentence or, or some humor. Family, but uh, that, but as I told you just a few minutes ago, so I've just right. gone to check out and the men's washroom me. and there was they only they one decipherable not, piece of graffiti. And it was a woman spread-eagled on 
the back with a dog in front of her, either defecating on her or urinating on her. It didn't look like it was fornicating. And there was a kind of caption on top that had been erased. I think it was also so difficult to see that I think it, they had tried to clean it off. You know, I'm not very fussy about that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, that's what you see most of in men's washrooms anyways. Looking at the bathroom wall as an example, bathroom graffiti as an example of uh, people um, expressing themselves because they feel repressed in other areas. So I think there's definitely that element of, um, you know, I can't talk about this elsewhere, so I'm going to have to do it here. Here in the Women's Centre of Concordia is housed a door that used to belong in a stall in the Hall building. In 93, this mural was painted to affirm the image of lesbian sexuality by challenging the hegemony of heterosexual images. The artist handed out flyers in the school to help encourage comments on the painting. And what was the response? Soon the question arose, was this vandalism or was this art? A lot of people see graffiti as a subversive, um, you know, vandalizing action. I kind of think of it as a means to expression. Why not? <laughs> Well, we know that graffiti has its good and bad points, but in the end, it always seems to have something to say. One thing you can always be sure of, you will always be able to check the writing on the wall. Nikki Campbell, Concordia Today. In a bid to attract students and show them the importance of a university education, Concordia's image campaign highlights exceptional students who've gone on to great things. My guest today is Mackie Vatikino Damas, who is now President and CEO of Murray Axmith Incorporated. Welcome, Mackie. So tell me what it is, uh, for those of us who aren't familiar with Murray Axmith, what it is that you do there. Well, uh, I'm president and CEO, as you said, and Murray Axmith is a company that specializes in career transition. Actually, it was the first company in Canada to specialize strictly in the career transition business, which includes everything from outplacement services, so when uh, uh, an executive or a person loses uh, his or her job in an organization, the organization will often pay for the services of a company like Murray Axmith, and the person can come to our offices and get an office, get uh, secretarial services, and most importantly, get the services of a consultant, of a specialist, who will help uh, this person first and foremost rebuild their confidence, secondly teach them really how to go out there in uh, today's world and get a new job, everything from writing a, C a CV to interviewing skills uh, and all of those types of things that we need today. And of course career transition isn't only when you lose your job, there's uh, many organizations where there's fewer and fewer promotions possible for people so they want to move people around between departments. We'll do the evaluation and analyze a person's strengths and weaknesses and help the organization and the person decide where they might best be suited to go to next. Okay, and this is a fairly new position for you? Yep, I yeah. just started uh, January 6th of this year. and. Um, I'm uh, really looking forward to the challenges, although it's, it's a bit like going home, I guess, because my background is in the human resource uh, area. Okay. Now, what is a day for you like? Well, I guess I can't tell you an average day yet, mm -hmm. since I've only been there uh, a short while, but I can tell you that uh, it's going to have a great deal of variety, uh, everything from um, 
meeting with clients and ensuring that our clients have the best possible services and the best value for their money to uh, meeting with employees to looking at new products and services that we might offer uh, to right now looking at uh, new premises for the company so it's got quite a variety of tasks in one day. Right. Certainly, I think uh, whether it's in this position or, or in any position, it's going to be long days, um, mm -hmm. most of the time starting quite early and finishing uh, quite late at night. But you enjoy what you do. So. I love what I do, yes. And do you find that the courses that you took at Concordia really helped you in what you're doing right now? I would have to say that uh, maybe not, you know, specific courses. I couldn't outline any one specific course, although I would definitely uh, have to say that the uh, whole experience at Concordia helped me in, in uh, many, many ways. Um, Concordia, first of all, I would, uh, would say that uh, a degree like a Bachelor of Commerce gives you a good background and a good basis from which to learn much easier when you go into an organization. Any organization you go into you have to go through a training period through an adjustment period but certainly when you've got something like a Bachelor of Commerce it really gives you that background and that information from which to learn from and it makes it much easier to learn secondly um, Concordia taught me how to prioritize how to uh, manage my time some semesters I was taking six courses so you had to learn how to prioritize as I'm sure mm -hmm. you know now <laughs> um, and I think from a business perspective what it really taught me was also the fact that you will never have 100% of the information upon which to take your decisions, uh, but that it's better to take decisions and to move forward based on the information that you do have rather than just sitting still and waiting for all the information to come to you because otherwise you'll never get anywhere and never do anything. Right. Now, you did a lot of things after you graduated. What were the steps uh, that led you to Murray Axsmith? Well, I've, um, first of all, I guess when I left uh, after my MBA, I went uh, back to the Bank of Montreal. I had been at the Bank of Montreal, um, you know, from my high school days, after my high school days, and I, I guess that was really the job that probably launched my career with respect to the management side of my career, particularly. Um, at the bank, I was one of the uh, first women of my age, of, uh, at the age of about 18, 19, to get onto what they called at that time in 1972 uh, a management training program. Uh, they didn't have many women, and uh, certainly not many women of 19 years old on that program. Um, from there, I uh, worked at Brown's Shoe Shop, which of course is uh, um, one of Canada's leading uh, shoe retailers in the high end shoes and that allowed me to travel all over the world and really uh, get that international exposure and experience uh, that has been very helpful to me in, in all the jobs that I've had. And um, from there, as I say, after my MBA, I went back to the Bank of Montreal uh, and worked uh, both as head of marketing for a couple of years for um, a commercial banking group and then as head of training, which is where I really got my HR experience. And from there, went on to um, be general manager of a company called Cala, which is a company in communications but focusing on HR communications, human resource mm -hmm. communications. And uh, I guess that's what really led me back to Murray Axsmith uh, What do now. you think out of all of those things was your best career move? My best career move was probably going to Cala. I had been at the bank at that point again another three years and it was, um, I was really enjoying it. I, uh, I was learning a lot. I had moved up fairly quickly. However, large corporations, um, your jobs are quite narrow in scope. Uh, going to a company like Cala Communications, which is, it was a company of about 150 people, and being a general manager for that company allowed me to put into practice everything I had learned at my other jobs, and more specifically, everything I had learned at my, in my MBA here at Concordia. Okay, and you've also learned, I'm assuming, from all your travels with Teleglobe and Brown Shoes. What do you think was the biggest lesson that you 
you got out of that? Out of traveling, I think, as most of us know, it really broadens your mind. Okay. Uh, you get a new perspective on things. You get a new perspective on Canada, for example, and how uh, lucky we are to live in a country like mm -hmm. Canada. Um, but it does make you much less judgmental, and uh, it makes you understand different people and different cultures much better, which, again, I think is very important in a country like ours that is made up of so many cultures and so many right. people with different backgrounds. It's important to have that uh, ouverture d'esprit, as they right. say, to uh, to really understand people. Okay. Well, Mackie, unfortunately, we're out of time. We could talk forever, but thanks a lot for being here. And for our viewers, just a little reminder, Concordia today will not air next week. We are on spring break, but we will return in two weeks' time. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at our email address, which is studio a at vax2.concordia.ca. Have a good week, everyone. Thanks, Mary.
Welcome to Concordia Today. I'm Natalie Vandenbosch. And I'm Annick Fussier. Later we'll have a report on the Peer Helper Program produced by Jessica Mockley. And reporter Jenny Raymond will interview Peter McLaughlin, who is president of McLaughlin Brewing. But first the news brought to you by the Concordia's Journalism Department. This fall, when Concordia opens its doors to thousands of new students, a few of its most valued colleges could be closing theirs. In a controversial document issued last week, Concordia's vice rector proposed the closure of Lonergan College and the Simone de Beauvoir Institute. A number of specialization and graduate programs are also threatened by the suggested cuts. The threat of a shutdown caused an uproar at the institute, but Rector Lowy says that no closures will be finalized until May. If you consider yourself a resident of Quebec, the law might disagree. Presently, anyone that has not lived in Quebec at least 12 months prior to attending university is considered an out-of-province student. Since tuition increases for out-of-province students will begin next fall, some students are planning to fight the government on their status. Concordia students are not only tired of waiting for the shuttle bus, but also for a bus shelter at Loyola campus. According to Concordia Student Union President Daniel Gagnon, the shelter will finally be here this spring. Geneviève Tremblay waits in line. It is February and students are lining up in the freezing cold, but a $35,000 shelter is just a few snowflakes away. The ideal location for building the shelter would have been uh, right in front of uh, the chapel at Loyola. However, we faced uh, certain difficulties in the sense that the chapel uh, is a historical building and is protected by the City of Montreal's regulation regarding old buildings. So, but now we've found a new location on West Broadway uh, adjacent to the Bryan's building. Uh, the, the construction will start in the spring. Uh, the bus shelter is going to be uh, roughly 60 feet by 20 feet. There's going to be lighting in there with uh, emergency phones. And there's also going to be some uh, space for publicity board for the CSU to fundraise some money for student activities. Although they're now really cold, the students are hot for the new shelter. Oh yeah, definitely, for sure. Definitely, because of the wind and the cold and the rain, you have to stand out in it? Of course. It would be great, you know, if I don't pay for it, you know. Since the shelter is not going to be built before the end of winter, next time you take the shuttle bus, make sure you bundle up. For Concordia Today, I'm Geneviève Tremblay. Students who feel like they live at the Meza Regis might want to consider putting their time to better use. Cusicor is looking for a new general manager to run the popular hangouts. The position is now open after Len Pemberton was released from his duties. The former manager violated a Cusicor bylaw when he hired himself to do another job there. Applications are now being accepted for his old job. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? The models in the magazines or each and every one of us? Unfortunately, many of us aspire to looking like models and are not satisfied until we do. But is this realistic? Tanya Kriviak has the answer. Every time we flip through a magazine, all we see are pictures of tall, skinny, beautiful people. But do these pictures portray realistic body images? Owen Moran, Concordia's health educator, says no and explains how to appreciate one's body. Somebody who has a healthy body image is somebody who feels comfortable about themselves. When they look at themselves, they, they may not like parts of themselves, but they acknowledge that. You know, they, they feel good about themselves. Their perception of their body is good. When they look in the mirror, they can say, you know, there are parts of me that aren't great, but most parts I love a lot. Besides, what we see in the magazines is nothing but a distorted version of the truth. It's an illusion and enjoy it as a fantasy, but don't internalize it. And we each have our own bodies, so the next time we look in the mirror, we should learn to appreciate its beauty. For Concordia Today, I'm Tana Kriviak. The Concordia Student Safety Patrol has changed its policy of always having one male and one female patroller. Aaron Plonsky, the coordinator of the CSSP, says that a shortage of female members have forced them to disregard the rule. Abby Sloan of the Concordia Women's Center says that the CSSP should work on attracting more female volunteers. The policy was to ensure that women, who make up 9 out of 10 calls to the CSSP, would not be uncomfortable being met by two men. There have been no complaints about the same-sex patrols as of yet. 
A musical composition with no melody, no rhythm, and no harmony came in first place at a CBC composer's contest. Concordia graduate Eric Tremblay picked up $5,000 for his winning piece. The composition uses electronic beeps, the hum of a printer, and bodily sounds. Tremblay then sketches and twists the noise past recognition. While some are sweating to the oldies, others are sweating to the sounds of white zombie ministry and alien sex fiends. With dreadlocks and combat boots, Daniel Hubbard is giving aerobics an alternative exercise. Jennifer Hollett works out. What is usually found in a mosh pit is breaking up a sweat in the gym. It's called rage aerobics. Well, I guess I started, uh, it was just per chance I was replacing a teacher and uh, I happened to have some music in my Walkman. But uh, the, the attire that I was wearing and also the music that I was using was pretty much different from what people were used to. Uh, it does come from an alternative uh, background. The students agree the class is all the rage. I find it very liberating to be able to, to dance at the same time as doing aerobic steps. Oh, it's the energy. The energy and the music. Um, the music is so different. I use industrial and somewhat gothic music and I like tribal and uh, ethnic music too. How does she choreograph Rage Against Aerobics? It's, well, it's just the feeling through the movement. If you're ready to turn in your night gears for combat boots, these aerobic classes take place at the Victoria Gym, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, starting at 12.05. For Concordia Today, I'm Jennifer Hollett. Students from the Concordia Animal Rights Association recently set out to prove that fur is dead. About 40 people demonstrated in front of fur retailers in honor of National Anti-Fur Day. Fur sporting pedestrians became aware that it was no skin off their back. One store representative said that while he was concerned with the use of animals, his main concern was to be in business profitably. A spokesperson from People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals said that the goal of the protest was to sensitize the public to the industry's cruel nature. Concordia students seeking worship or prayer can visit the Loyola Chapel, located next to the AD building. On Sundays, they'll enjoy the musical talent of the chapel's choir. Tim Sargent caught up with the choir recently and learned that as much as they're appreciated, they're in need of a singer or two. Every Sunday at 10 a.m., the Loyola Chapel Choir rehearses for the day's mass. They've been performing under director Elizabeth Eckholm for the last 12 months. Congregation members enjoy the music, saying it's an integral part of Sunday service. The fact that uh, we're so beautifully led in our singing, I think it, it just makes it what, what the, uh, the liturgical and Eucharistic celebration should be about. But Father David Ely says that church members themselves have a role to play. The ideal is to have the whole congregation singing, and the choir is there as a helper. Eckholm says that the choir singers do their best to make up for their small size. A lot of pieces can be adapted uh, for three voices. You know, we've done Bach chorales and just, you know, you just adapt them for soprano, alto, and bass. Despite efforts made by the church to recruit additional members, they're still in need of either a tenor or a bass. Yet they hope to make up for this shortfall by Easter. For Concordia Today, I'm Tim Sargent. Two students with their heads up holding a light source is not the punchline of a changing a light bulb joke. Instead, it's the logo for the capital campaign fundraising drive. The designer says he wants the logo to give people a sense of optimism. It's supposed to represent the light at the end of the tunnel. A McGill student and Concordia professor may have solved the sexual problems of people on Prozac. James Cantor, a clinical psychology student from McGill, hypothesized that Prozac lowered levels of oxytocin, a chemical in the body that enhances sexual arousal. With the help of Concordia professor Jim Faust, Cantor proved his theory on laboratory rats. The next step will be for Cantor to see permission for clinical trials. And that's the news for this week. I'm Annie Cloutier. And I'm Natalie Vandenbosch. Coming up next on Concordia Today, a report on the Peer Helper Program by Jessica Mockley. Also, reporter Jenny Raymond will interview Peter McCausland, President and CEO of McCausland Brewing. Have a good week, everyone. Is school tough? Is life hard? Are your friends tired of listening to you complain? There's another alternative for you. 
The Peer Helper Program is a student-staffed listening and referral service. Um, we run a drop-in center at, um, which is on uh, 2090 Mackay Street, um, room 02. It's on the ground level floor. And it's a, uh, you know, no appointment needed um, kind of uh, uh, set up. And, um, you know, people can drop in. They can get information. They can talk about a personal issue or an academic issue. Uh, if they're, uh, if a student is not sure who, um, who they should be seeing about a problem, peer helpers would be a good, per a good place to drop in because, uh, you know, a peer helper will, will, will generally know or will, if, if, he or she, if the peer helper doesn't know, he or she will find out for you. So uh, we kind of try to take the, the philosophy uh, or the approach that the buck stops here. We're not going to just say we don't know and, you know, go here to find out. We'll, we'll, we'll spend the time on the phone, try to find out where the best place is for you to be. Surprised that a program like this exists at Concordia? Despite all of their efforts, the Peer Helper Program is still one of the university's best kept secrets. The, the forms of publicity used, uh, and some people would argue are, are lacking, <laughs> um, but generally are through the uh, student newspapers um, and also brochures that are passed out. Um, and some other areas too, we have bookmarks that are made up for the peer helpers and they're distributed in the bookstores or they're left on uh, countertops in the information booths in uh, the Concordia Student Union. Well, what we have tried once before, uh, we've made alterations. I mean, we've done the hot chocolate drive a few years ago. In fact, we had to uh, convince students that there was no catch to, to taking the chocolate um, because it was given out for free. We had an open house. That, unfortunately, wasn't very successful. What, what generally brings in the students is word of mouth. We've had classroom presentations, uh, but I think it's just when a student has the need and knows of our existence that they will decide to come in, obviously, and that happens by word of mouth. Once people learn about the program, when do they start coming in? The service is used the most, probably around exam time when people are feeling really stressed or um, perhaps towards the beginning of the year, the beginning of the semesters, as we have uh, out-of-town students, students who it's their first year. Again, it's, it's really when the stress levels are probably going to be the highest that we'll see uh, the most clients coming in using the service. What are the things you see right now? I don't know if you have like in your head about it right now. Students come in with a, a variety of problems, um, you know, ranging from personal to academic. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want an example of, of you know, of a student that's come in, but I mean, I remember um, last year or this semester, I've had a student who came in, uh, she, it was her first time away from home, um, she, it was her first semester at Concordia, and she really didn't know very many people. She was, she was very nervous. Um, she was her first time living, you know, living on her own. And really just needing someone to talk to is, is why she came in. And a lot of times, a lot of, the, you know, a lot of people come in and they just, they don't have anyone else to, to share with or to get information from. And it's, it's really scary being on your own and just having someone there to listen and to support you is, is really helpful. The peer helpers themselves also have a place to go when they need someone to turn to. They receive ongoing supervision and support. So we meet every second week. Um, they, they get a chance to reflect on the kinds of issues uh, that, uh, that arose with the students coming into the office during the week. Um, <coughs> of course, uh, all, all um, issues, all, all concerns are completely confidential, so no student is ever named uh, within the, um, the peer helping uh, case conferencing. But, but we do talk about how did the peer helper respond to that student and so the peer helpers are always learning, you know, they, they, they get feedback on, you know, what they did really well, also maybe what more could they have done or what other kind of thing could they have done. I've tried to let the program develop organically so that the feedback that I get from the peer helpers and from the students that we serve uh, is, the, you know, the way that, that uh, the program has developed and, and we, we, we really take that feedback seriously and listen to it and try to build. Um, in that way, so it's it's grown. It's been a real. It, it's a 
it's a really rewarding uh, program to coordinate, and I, I hope continues for many years. I've had a great time here, and I think uh, people um, benefit from the program, whether they're in it or they experience the program by coming in as a client or a student who needs help. And I just wish, I mean, more people would come to Peer Helpers, not necessarily if they need a problem, but just to talk, because we are your peers, and we're there to listen. Whenever you need a sympathetic, listening ear, the Peer Helper Center is there for you. 2090 Mackay, Monday to Thursday, 11 to 5. For Concordia Today, this is Jessica Mockley. With the job market in such an unbalanced state, many Canadians have the dream of starting their own business. Our guest today accomplished this task by brewing his hobby into a successful career. He is Concordia alumnus Peter McCoslin, president and CEO of McCoslin Brewing. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, when you first started brewing beer as a teenager, was it your goal to expand it into some kind of business? No, I never thought of it, uh, of it that way. It was just something to do, kind of fun to experiment with uh, this and that. Uh, so it was, no, it was really never, it was strictly a hobby thing. Yeah. It wasn't until, uh, you know, I did it for about 25 years and I started to see small breweries opening up here and there that I thought I could maybe turn it into a business. And how did your teenage hobby sort of turn into a business? When did you? Well, at the, uh, of course, my, uh, I'd, I'd say that my, my motivation when I was a teenager and a young uh, adult uh, was to make cheap, uh, cheap beer, frankly. Uh, but as time went on, it was, uh, it was more to make a, a very unique and interesting sorts of beers. And, and uh, I started to see guys in the U.S. and people in Western Canada making very interesting beers. And I said, gee, they can do it there then certainly I can do it. At that point I was an administrator at, at Dawson College mm -hmm. and uh, I was ready for a change. But how does someone get started in brewing beer for a living? Well, it's, uh, in this case, you know, if I tried to do this 25 years ago, start a small brewery, uh, it wouldn't have worked because the circumstances weren't right for it. And I think that, uh, uh, I guess the one smart thing I did is I was aware that I could s start making beer as a business at a certain point in time, that the, the, the circumstances in the economy, there were enough sort of consumers interested and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the population was ready for that sort of thing, whereas 25 years ago, uh, it, it, wouldn't have, it, ne it just wouldn't have worked. Okay. Was leaving your job as post-secondary uh, secretary general at Dawson a difficult decision for you? Uh, somewhat. Uh, you know, there's a lot of security, of course, when you work in public administration, but uh, the, sec the trade off for security is working comparatively grinding routine tasks, and of course, the politics of budget cutting in the public sector aren't much fun. So, uh, so on one hand, I was losing security and taking a, a jump into the unknown. On the other hand, I was leaving work, which, quite frankly, wasn't all that satisfying. No, well, why? Well, you know, the, the politics of institutions, uh, the, amount of, uh, uh, the amount of heat surrounding redu reduction in budgets and staff layoffs and so on and so forth. And uh, I'd worked at Dawson for a number of years, and it was, and, it was, and still is, I think, a very creative uh, and, uh, and courageous institution and in what it takes on. But after 13 years, I was really ready for a tr change. And, I, you know, the politics and, the, and the, all the work involved in the institution, I was ready to, to try something. So new. you don't regret that career move? No, not at all. This is uh, frankly, uh, beer making uh, and the whole brewing industry uh, and small business and private business is very, very different. We control our own destiny. We make our own decisions. We live with the, with the results of those decisions, of course. Uh, so, uh, no, it's, a, it's an awful lot more fun, and I think it's uh, been good for me as an individual. Uh, I've grown. I've uh, met a lot of people in a lot of different places, different businesses, and have had a tremendous number of opportunities. So, no, I think it's been, uh, it's, uh, I look back on it, it was the right decision for sure. You have won eight international prizes for your beer. Uh, was that your goal when you first started? 
Uh, when we started, it was really just to make a, a beer for consumers uh, that was different from the beer made by Labatt and Molson to try to come up with something that was a, truly a different sort of product. We didn't think that we would end up uh, winning international uh, prizes for our products, and uh, that wasn't really a goal. But now that we're there, uh, we're perceived as being one of the best brewers in the country and in North America and internationally, uh, quite frankly, we're going to continue in the same vein. And how big a step was it for you to expand your business in the U.S.? Uh, not a tremendously large step at the time because when we, we went into the U.S. market in 1991 and the small brewers were there but they were not uh, doing a tremendous amount of business yet so we got our foothold in early and uh, we've been just expanding our sales ever since. Our goal is to have 10 percent of our sales in the U.S. and we're already, we've already achieved that. How do, how do smaller Canadian brewers fare in the U.S. you think? Um, quite well. Canadian beer internationally has a pretty positive reputation and, uh, and as a result uh, consumers of imported products in the U.S. look to Canadians for better beer than the big American breweries uh, produce for them. So it, it wasn't that difficult but of course like everything else you've got to grind away at it and you have to work at it day in and day out. Yeah. And how did, how did your education at Concordia help you? Well, uh, you know, of course, I, I wasn't a business student here. I was uh, an art student, and um, and I think that uh, a lot of the things that you pick up as a, a general art student, uh, uh, creative thinking, mm -hmm. critical thinking, uh, broader horizons, all of those things, uh, the ability to read, write, and think critically, I think those are all key elements to success, whether it, regardless of what you're doing. And so I'd say that Concordia was extremely helpful for me uh, in that regard. That, and what advice do you have for students who eventually want to start their own business? Well, I, first of all, stay here. You don't have to run off to somewhere else in North America or Canada. Stay in Quebec, stay in Montreal. There are opportunities here. It's a wonderful place to live. I've had the opportunity of looking a lot of other places and I always come home and I always feel good to be here. Stay here, uh, think, uh, look around you for opportunities and then be prepared if you've got the guts and the energy to start something on your own. Just just be ready for it but don't leave here there's lots of opportunities here that you won't find anywhere else is, is it realistic though because a lot of people say there aren't many opportunities there how, yeah. how do you sort of stand out when everybody says there's no opportunities that means for the person who thinks hard there are opportunities I think that's the key thing and I know that right now for for people in your age group and uh, many students who are you know in university and just left university it's tough it is tough but uh, that's not, that's, there's no reason to just assume that that means there aren't possibilities. It's the, the person who's prepared to look for the opportunities who will find them and who will do something with them. In your opinion, to start a business, what should be your first step? Uh, the first step is, uh, well, prepared to work extremely hard. Uh, there's, uh, that, it doesn't matter what, how good your idea, ideas are. The fundamental thing is you have to be committed, and that means... Uh, it's all, it's, it's all or nothing really. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is look at problems differently than the way everybody else looks at them. Uh, look at products that need to be looked at differently from a consumer point of view, services that aren't being offered to people, there are opportunities. Um, there are certainly are all sorts of possibilities in a changing demographic. The fact that we've got some aging populations. If I was someone who was, uh, who was leaving university shortly, I might think very strongly about the fact that there's a population of baby boomers like, like I am who are getting older. So what opportunities is that going to create for your generation? Very, there's going to be lots of them. And one last question. What did your university, what is the most important thing that you got out of your... I'd say the most critical thing, well, I remember one course. Uh, I don't know if it's still been given. It was a philosophy course. It was philosophy, I believe it was 101 way back then. And it was a, a basically a critical thinking course. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, gave me more skills, that one course. That alone, I think, was worth the price of my okay. tuition. Thank you for joining us. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Um, join us again next week when reporter Natalie Vandenbosch will interview former Concordia journalism student Gwen Talbart, who now works at the Weather Network. And if you have any questions or comments, you can always email us at studioa at vax2.concordia.ca. That's studioa at vax2.concordia.ca. Thank you for joining us at Concordia today. Have a good week, everyone.